Welcome to Hormones with Sam, your guide through the confusing world of hormone health. I'm your host, Sam Bo Patrick, here to help you demystify and unlock the secrets to living a vibrant, happy life. Together, let's make hormones fun and sexy. Hello, and welcome to Hormones with Sam. Thank you so much for tuning in. And today, what I want to do with you is share who I am why you should be listening to me or maybe not, and why I've put this podcast together because it's super important. You'll be part of this journey and I'd love to deliver some things that I've learned along the way as a professional and also as a mum and a woman on this planet for quite a few decades now. So uh, we go back to the start. I was born in Hobart down in Tasmania and uh, it was such a you know, wonderful place to be born. But mum went uh, up north when I was quite young, left my father and um, we had a I actually had about six years growing up in a nursery, can you believe it? And uh, that that introduced me to plants, I guess, and uh, I absolutely loved my time in the garden and watering and all those sorts of things. Headed back down to Hobart, though, with mum, and she uh, tragically died when I was 12 years old. Now, it was a skiing accident. A lot of people want to know what happened. Uh, it was two days out. This is a real time frame from when Prince Charles and Lady Di were married. So mum was skiing, she was 33, hit a uh, ski rope and uh, ended up tearing ligaments, went into hospital and didn't come out, had a blood clot. So from a young age, you know, I'd heard a lot of medical terminology and I can't, you know, some people wanted to be a pilot when they were younger. Some people wanted to be this and that. I knew I wanted to be an air host stewardess in those days because that was the, the glam thing to do. And it wasn't really until grade 11 and 12 that I thought about becoming a nurse or a physiotherapist. I knew at that point I was playing a lot of sport that I loved the way the human body responded to things in the environment and things that we fueled it with. In fact, I loved it so much I, was, uh, I started putting out a newsletter in grade 12 about food and how, how it enhances performance for athletes. Fast track to... Well, I, I won't put the actual date on it, but you've got a bit of a time frame. Uh, I ended up studying at the Royal Hobart Hospital and became a general nurse. And it was pretty full on. You know, I was 17. Uh, I'd, I'd had the latter years growing up with my nonno, my Italian grandpa. And that was, actually, I'll come back to nonno because he was a key feature for me in my life. And I, I thank him every day because he really anchored me into uh, what I'd call normal living, you know, having a normal mindset and uh, loving nature. But ended up at the Royal Hobart training there when I was 17 and, you know, you have six weeks in your first block and then you start going to different wards. My first ward was oncology and oncology is where people with cancer go and I was very young, you know, if, if you think about a 17-year-old now, they can't, they can barely drive, let alone, you know, they think they know everything but I look back now and I was quite raw and uh, I remember this particular day and uh, I was sitting by this patient's bed and the, the doctors, you know, on their white coats went round and they used to do what's called grand rounds. And they still do grand rounds. They go around with the whole team, you know, the, the specialists, the registrars, the, the nurse unit manager, social workers, physios, anyone else who's involved with the care of that patient. And they stood around this pa particular patient's bed and, you know, I was a, I was a student nurse I was sitting there, it was quite intimidating when people stand around your bed and you feel like they have your health in their hands. Like it's a very vulnerable, scary situation. I wish it was done differently. And I think that's why I kind of sidled in beside this patient because I could see this was, you know, this was hard news that she was about to be delivered. And they stood there and, you know, kind of hands in their pockets, and very little compassion. And they said to her, yeah, we went in, you know, it didn't look good. Um, you've got bowel cancer and we've given you three months, so we just stitched you up and uh, you probably want to go home and sort your affairs out. And it was pretty that blunt, pretty that much that quick. And I remember looking at this lady just feeling, you know, incredible empathy. And uh, I, I hope it never happens to anyone again like that, but it does day in, day out. And I thought this could be done differently. Interesting, you know, they kind of swan, you know, the, the cloud of doom and gloom moves on to the next patient and does something similar. But I hung back with that patient and had a little chat to her and she was quite young and she did have bowel cancer. Um, but I saw this grit in her eyes, like a real grit. And she, she left, she was discharged. They gave her three months to live. Well, blow me down, I saw her six months later, nearly recovered 
And I remember just being bedazzled by this woman and uh, I saw her downstairs in the foyer and I just went, whoa, what's going down? And she had taken herself away out of a, a system that was not really health related but surgical and pharmaceutical related and said, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to open some corridors to health that I'm not being presented with here. And that's exactly what she did. So she took herself overseas in those days and she tried what would have deemed, been deemed alternative therapies, um, nutrition and a couple of other protocols and came back pretty much healed. That was my real mm-hmm moment, you know. That was when I went, wow, you know, there's something in food, there's something in uh, the way we treat ourselves, our mindset, all of that can come together and be our, um, our medicine, our in, in, internal strength that we often don't know about. So uh, with that, I just thought, right, that's it, you know. I'm going to treat everyone as a whole from here on forward and certainly did. Now, just to digress, to fit, um, talk about Nonna, so when mum died, you know, I shuffled around lots of relatives and uh, in grade 10 I ended up with my Italian grandpa. My grandma went to Europe and did an arts degree, but that's another story. So it was very much Nonna, myself and my little sister. And one of the things that kept me going apart from sport and having incredible friends and parents of friends who I guess a village raises the child it was this uh, terrace backyard. So we had a huge backyard in Hobart and uh, Nono used to, as a lot of Italians are and a lot of other cultures are, they love growing their own food. So Nono had a plethora of vegetables always available, tomatoes, lettuce, beans, uh, fennel, broccoli, carrots, beetroot, the whole lot. We also had quite a few fruit trees which were fantastic I'd, and I'd find myself after school or on weekends, up in the backyard, feasting on produce straight off the plant and known that it had been grown with love, prepared with love. And I, I still to this day am very grateful that I had those moments where I could love food, you know, rather than um, see it as a hate thing. Interesting though, I had an auntie and, uh, you know, Italian family, and she used to love baking. Now, this auntie was a pretty cool cook. She was pretty amazing and she would make lots of slices and cakes and I remember, you know, around Christmas time we'd have these beautiful little fruit mince tarts that she would do from short crust um, pastry and fill the little fruit mince in it and drizzle icing on it and they were just amazing. Uh, we had a huge pantry and that's where all the baked goods used to live. So I would find myself in between study moments, which seemed to become more frequent at <laughs> the study pauses where I'd bounce into the pantry and consume an incredible amount of these sweet things. In fact, I look back on it now as a grown-up and the things I talk about now with hormones, I truly was developing a sugar addiction. There's no doubt about it. Unspeknownst to me though, you know, as a teenage girl. The sugar cycle, and some of you may relate to the sugar cycle, you get on it and it's very difficult, difficult to break it. It is, sugar's more addictive than cocaine and it lights up parts of the brain that makes you feel really good and feel pleasure. So once you're on that like little trajectory, you need the skills to get off it because otherwise that becomes your life. So fortunately for me, I was playing lots of sport, but I was eating way more than I needed and I definitely developed this sugar addiction. Just to put a little bit, and some of you will relate to this, um, around that time, Weight Watchers was becoming really popular. And they had a little counter book, you know, about the size of your palm. And that was our little Bible. You know, I was that generation where we used to refer to our little counter book. How many calories are in ice cream? How many calories are in margarine? Ooh, ooh, ooh. And you'd unconsciously, well, it became unconscious because you started understanding that food had energetic or an energy calorie count to it, but your whole life became about point counting. So I'm of a generation, and I still know many women out there struggle with this. They don't really care about the nutrient content, they just count the points and they feel guilty if they lean outside of that. But I was definitely that generation and it wasn't until um, I moved to Melbourne um, after my training at the Royal Hobart, further my studies in Melbourne, critical care, ICU, emergency nursing, absolutely thrived, loved it, and started to burn out. Now, whilst in Melbourne, this is why I think I burned out, the sugar addiction continued. I was studying full-time at uni, so four subjects a term to become a critical care nurse. I was working four or five days a week and I was also playing sport. I was training. I was in the Australian squad for lacrosse, played water polo, 
um, at a very high level as well and absolutely loved it, partying, very little sleep. So I got into this habit of making Rocky Road. So I'd come home after a night duty or a, a day shift or an afternoon shift, you know, 10 o'clock at night, emergency, doing CPR and uh, road traumas and all sorts of things that you can imagine that you see on TV. And I'd come home, I'd be pretty wound up, and my way of coping and getting through the night to study was to make this slab of rocky road. And I can still remember the recipe, it's not hard. It was a cup of peanuts, um, the packet of cherries, a family block of chocolate, which I used to tell myself was healthy, and Pascal's marshmallows, whole packet. Mix it all in, put it in a slab, and that used to see me go through the night for six to seven hours. I feel a little bit shameful sharing this, but some of you will relate, I suspect, because we do these closet activities and no one sees them, but they sabotage any best intention. So once again, I probably wasn't aware of the harm I was doing or the sugar cycle that I was on. And the rocky road was my little secret, my little secret weapon to get through everything I was doing. So four years in Melbourne, as I said, finished up having absolute ball, love Melbourne. I used to think everyone should have a year in Melbourne just as a sabbatical because it's just a beautiful city, fun city. But by the end of it, I was looking at my colleagues in emergency department and I saw burnout for the first time. I saw what burn, burnout really looks like in a person. And this is how it came across to me. I would look at my colleagues and, you know, emergency department, not many, people don't voluntarily go there, you know, they're, they're scared that their child's dying or they're scared that they're dying or they have a mental health issue and they think they're dying or they think that, you know, Jesus is talking to them or whatever's going on for them. It's not a place generally that people put their hands up and go, oh, yeah, I want to go there unless they also have another condition that's not normal. So people that were coming there are vulnerable, they're, they're, they're unwell, they're going through a crisis and they need compassion. But I remember I, I started to see fractures in, my, in, in the, the delivery of care and the way people were talked to and not looked after. Once again, a bit like the white coat thing with the doctors around that patient that day, I thought I don't want to become like them. I don't want to talk down to people. I don't want to give them the compassion and the love that they need. I don't want to placate them, chastise them. And I thought it's time to get out. So that I, I left went overseas, went to Thailand, uh, had, I was going to work for Care Australia, which is an HIV program there. But things didn't, that wasn't what the universe had in store for me. Uh, a few things happened there that were quite eventful, might pop up in a book one day, I don't know, but ended up back in Australian, on Australian soil and uh, secured a job. Interesting, I, I remember I landed and uh, opened up the paper, paper in those days, and uh, there was a job saying, you know, pharmaceuticals. And I thought, oh, might give that a crack. Went along, got the job just like that. So that a lot of people find it odd that a naturopath or a nutritionist has had eight to nine years in pharmaceuticals. I can say with my hand and my heart, it was some of the best years of my life. And the information we were taught, um, my understanding of pharmaceuticals, I used to go overseas, bring back the latest pharmaceuticals and present them at huge medical conferences where there'd be 200 doctors in the room, specialists down to registrars, and I was the person who had that information and it really sharpened up what I understood about pharmacology within the body naturally and synthetically. You needed to know your stuff. I mean, I was teaching specialists. I was teaching infectious disease doctors about antivirals, about anti-infectives and modes of action and uh, lots of you know technical things that I needed to know inside out. So it, it was the, the best training I've ever had in any medical role and it also taught me a lot about business and business acumen because I was given huge budgets and with that budget pretty much the sky was the limit. Uh, ethics have changed a little bit now in pharma but certainly back in the day when I was in pharma I was whining and dining and doing a lot of business at the bar and certainly that was just the way it was done. That's just the way it is uh, but a lot of content. I was very committed to understanding that what I was doing well, what I believed I was doing was enhancing the end uh, consumer's experience of their, of their health. So I believe that pharmaceuticals, and I still believe today that pharma has a massive role in people's health, and I like to see my approach to everything as complementary, not alternative, not one or the other. But unfortunately, things seem to have been eroded and 
from, particularly from the medical profession, it's like, ooh, that woo-woo stuff that doesn't have evidence-based medicine. And I'm planted in that side now going, hang on, there's heaps of evidence-based medicine and most pharma actually has its origins in nature. So after eight to nine years in pharmaceuticals, um, actually bef before I finished in pharma, I lived in Sydney for a couple of years. Sounds like I jumped around, I kind of did, worked my way up the coast and uh, started doing a nutrition uh, diploma at uh, I think it was the Australian College of Natural Medicine in Sydney and my teacher was amazing. She, her name's Mim Beam and she was a bit like that guy out of, uh, I've forgotten the movie where he jumps on the table and he's um, not goodwill hunting, I've forgotten but anyway he's, you know, he's so passionate and he's, he really drives home the message and you can just tell through his every being that he's so passionate about nutrition. And that's exactly how I am about nutrition. I believe it's the foundation to absolutely everything. Once you get that underway and once you understand the power of food, you can change your life. So from nutrition and just learning, I became vegetarian for a year and a half. Uh, that was just, I don't know, a little phase I went through and I've had a couple of those phases since. Uh, now I say I'm flexitarian, which means I try and listen to my body and what it needs. At the moment it seems to be needing iron and lots of red meat. So um, I don't, uh, you know, when I've flexed in and out of these different um, eating plans, it's because I've really tried to tap into what my body's saying it requires. Uh, but from nutrition, moved up to the Gold Coast and worked out pretty quickly, I wanted to become an individual practitioner. I wanted to use my nursing, I wanted to use my pharmaceutical and pharmacology knowledge, but I wanted to match it to nature and show people the power that they have in their own backyard through food, through mindset, through supplements and uh, that whole um, pharmacopoeia that they can tap into that doesn't cost an arm and a leg, that they can be self-empowered about. So to become a, a practitioner, I really needed natural medicine. So I finished my natural medicine and at this stage I had two children and I had met the father of those two girls and uh, this was an interesting interesting time in my life. So many of you will relate to this, particularly if you've been a mum and you've tried to keep working. And then if you've been really like, mm -hmm, you know, I'll give, I'll give study a go on top of it, you'll know exactly what happened this particular night that I'm going to share with you. I had this vision. I had a huge vision and I still have this huge vision. But at the time it was that I could have 10 clinics around the country where doctors referred to my services or the, the clinic services to offer patients a holistic approach, a holistic approach where they could have uh, homeopathy, med medicinal advice, pharma pharmacopoeia if they needed it, and natural advice, chiropractic, body work, like a whole spectrum of things. And that's that was my vision back then. I really believed it was possible. I saw that there was unity between medicine and all these other modalities that could really enhance someone's life. Pretty naive looking back on it now, but that was my vision. And I got to the stage where I had three clinics, five staff, two little children, um, my little one, my middle child, she's the middle now, was only 10 months old. And I thought, and I was studying at uni because I wanted a bachelor in health science. And uh, I was about eight days back from Christmas. I have to take a big breath, <laughs> just relaying the stories like, oh my gosh, this definitely was a moment that changed my life. So I had a dinner party on a Friday night. My then husband just went along with it as they do, which was, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know, where this story's going. Um, I won't do the spoiler alert just yet. People were coming around, you know, pouring them wine, champagne. Um, it was a Friday night. Don't ever hold a dinner party on a Friday night. And at the end of this story, I'd almost be encouraging never hold a dinner party. There's no need for it anymore. But anyway, you know, I had one of those women's weekly cookbooks and it was dinner party for 25 and I just used to fantasise about, oh, I'll just, you know, have this great dinner party and wow everyone and, you know, uh, nourish all my friends. That's all I wanted to do. Nourish them, say I love you. He's the best of me. So Friday night, hair's up in a ponytail, got some little antler-y things on and it's Christmas and it's eight days out and if you know the Gold Coast, eight days out from Christmas is historically hot. We had a gully kitchen, you know, a little thin little thing, and uh, outside would have been about 35. Inside in that kitchen would have been about 85. It was so hot. I had a ham going. I'd never cooked a ham before. Had my Uncle Pete's recipe. I had a turkey that I was basting. Never done that before. And I'd even gone to the effort to get one of those little things you stick in it. 
It tells you when it's cooked. So I had everything bubbling along and humming along. I had desserts going, veggies going, the whole lot. And it really was um, probably about 60 degrees in that kitchen. And I just remember I was um, stuffing this turkey, you know, basting a turkey, my ham was down as turkey, and my little baby, um, she was still in nappy, she was 10 months old, came out and I didn't really see her at first, but, you know, you're kind of aware at the corner of your eye and then I got the aroma. I was like, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> she'd filled a nappy and it was just one of those moments of, oh, you know, you kind of, whew, you, you have to blow out, not breathe in because you nearly pass out. And um, I remember looking down going, oh, my God, we've got a code brown. Um, need some help, Houston. And uh, we had those bifold windows in the kitchen and um, I was like, oh, I need some help, serious help. And I called out to my then husband, I've only had one, but ex-husband. I said, oh, you know, who? Come in and I need some help. And in front of all our friends who were partying, there's this dead silence and he turned around and said no. And I just remember, and I remember this moment so vividly, I had my hand stuck down the turkey and I just remember this, this feeling of rage. I remember the, the knives were all there and I just kind of, you know, he gave them that you know, split second. He's just so lucky my hand's in this turkey and he's really lucky the turkey's not flying through the air at him right now. And this rage scared the bejeebas out of me. Hand out, abort, abort, go and deal with the code brown. Came back in, started, you know, sweat brow, cooking everyone's dinner. But something changed in me. Something changed that I couldn't unchange. And I really wanted to know more about that moment. Eight days later, I left the marriage. Actually, before I left the marriage, two of our friends came in from outside and they, you know, thin little kitchen, and they bailed me up and they said, Sammy, when you speak like that, you sound like an absolute beep. And I just remember going, whoa. I sound like a beep. <laughs> he, he didn't help me. And, you know, all these feelings flooded through my body and rage was the main one. Rage, I felt ashamed that my friends had kind of, I guess, caught me out. I felt embarrassed. I felt humbled. I felt all sorts of things. And that spectrum of emotion led me to leave the marriage eight days later because I was confused. Why did I feel that way? I certainly didn't want to feel that way again. And if I was feeling that way, hell, <laughs> you know, that, that wasn't healthy. I knew it wasn't conducive to a supportive, loving marriage. And I thought maybe he's feeling the, other, the same way. But he was a typical man, didn't speak about it. So I left. So eight days later, left, and it started me on this journey, a big journey where I started uh, looking for answers. I was looking for answers why I felt that way that night. I went to doctors, I went to chiropractors, I went to spiritual healers, I went to a spectrum of health practitioners and not one person could help explain why I had anger or rage that night. In fact, one doctor said, oh, you're depressed, here, take these antidepressants. And I was like, I'm not depressed, I feel fine. I just felt angry. Now, at the same time, I also noticed I really struggled to relax. I struggled to sit down at night to feel content. There's always something I had to do. I also had some of the symptoms like whiskers. Um, I guess thin hair, but I probably wasn't looking in the mirror too much because I was too busy. <laughs> you know, if I stop and think about it, probably had the thin hair. Uh, and I was training you know, in the Australian Dragon Boat team at this time. So we were training quite a lot, eight to nine times a week, pretty active, ate reasonably well. And I still had a fat tummy. I could not get rid of my little fat tummy. So six months in, and I had a lot of staff, you know, I had five staff and we had three busy clinics, I thought I would check my hormones. Now, this was a game changer, checking my hormones, because it wasn't done a lot back in this time. This was 2005. And I knew there was something not right in my body. And at that point in time, endocrinologists were the only specialists that looked after hormones. And very, very few natural medicine practitioners were also specialising in hormones. So I did a saliva test because I'd read, and I still know to this day, that blood testing is an absolute waste of time if you want to know what your sex hormones are doing or your adrenal hormones. So I did this saliva test. It changed my life. What I discovered on that hormone test was that my male hormone, testosterone, it was through the roof. It would have been higher than my then husband's and no doubt a lot of men around me. So I wanted to know why. Why had that happened? What was going on in my body that created that uh, hormone confusion? 
And more importantly, I went to research papers and books and PubMed and everything else. There was very, very little research on it. In fact, the only research on high testosterone in women was with female inmates. People who had made it to jail because of that anger moment. So I wanted to really get down and dirty with testosterone and find out why I had that problem. And I wrote a book on it. And that book is called Beauty and the Beast Within. Now that book, uh, it's, you know, you can still get it. It's a bestseller. It saw me on Sunrise Today, Today Tonight, uh, um, Today Extra, interviewed all around Australia and particularly, you know, interviews over, around the world on my information into why women were developing high testosterone. It hadn't been looked at before. And at that point in time, high androgens in women, so testosterone's an androgen, was called polycystic ovary syndrome. And I pushed to have it renamed female hormone disorder, FHD, because plenty of girls who have high testosterone don't make cysts. And if you're looking for cysts as a key marker of polycystic ovary syndrome, you're gonna miss everything else. So from that book, you know, I've identified four main archetypes that end up with PCO. I've started talking about hormones all the time. It became my you know, second language. Uh, I was told I was gonna to be on Oprah when she came out in 2010. Uh, so that was the Australian Tourism Board put me forward to be interviewed by Oprah. So I wrote another book. That book was on menopause. And whilst I hadn't been through menopause, certainly had lots of women who'd come through the clinic who were uh, going through the change of life. Now, the reason I have such a depth of knowledge about hormones isn't just drawing on my own experience. With the five staff and all the patients that were coming to us, and the fact that saliva testing still to this day is not covered under a health scheme, I said to my staff, can we ask our clients if they would be prepared to pay out of pocket and have their hormones measured? We found an incredible eight in 10 women had a hormone imbalance that were unaware of it, that the doctors hadn't picked up on, and once we sorted it out, changed their life. So with that information, I was able to really understand hormones. Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, my two favorites, oxytocin, dopamine, and probably my third favorite, vitamin D. So from there, I became a best-selling author. Menopause became a best-selling book as well. Um, I've written one for males. It's called um, Keeping Up, <laughs> um, the tech manual on keeping up. Uh, I've got one on fertility. 75% of women in my country, Australia, are infertile due to high testosterone and it can drop, testosterone can drop in seconds. It's quite remarkable when you know how to manipulate your hormones and bring them back into, into um, balance. Um, got another book, Wait, It's Your Hormones, and I'm going away this week actually to write my, uh, it'll be the eighth one in the series. So from that I speak, um, I do interviews, and a podcast for me is a natural progression. You see, I know that women are not broken. I know that in menopause they're not broken. And I really want to push back on this myth that women are being told that you're broken, you need HRT. Because that's what's happening at the moment. The big narrative in this country is that, oh yeah, you're going, you know, you're 45 and you're having a flush, your body won't make hormones anymore, you need this pill. And it's just not true. We've been doing this for years and years, thousands of years, women have been just passing through menopause naturally. And if that's a legacy that I can leave on the planet, that you're not broken and you can do this naturally, then I'll be happy. You know, my time here will be worthwhile. So my goal with the podcast is to inspire as many women as I can worldwide to create conversations because, you know, it's hard talking about our hormones. It's hard telling your girlfriends that you suffer with anger. In fact, women don't say that. They don't have rage. They don't have anger. They just get shitty or a little bit irritable or so-and-so is giving me the We placate it. We don't talk about it enough. And when women get to menopause, they, they can be bombarded with a stack of misinformation and they get really confused about it because they end up, you know, they're, they're barely survival mode. They're in survival mode. They're barely coping anyway. So if someone says, here's the magic you know, thing, they're going to jump on it, um, particularly if it's given by somebody that they trust. So with that, I'm hoping with this podcast, it, this will create conversations in tea rooms, in cars with your daughters in um, big, bigger environments. And if you're a practitioner listening to this, I hope that you'll also get lots of bits of gold that you can use for your clients as well, because I do believe we're on a uh, beautiful opportunity here to um, empower women again with folklore and nature and things that have always served us well. So for some of you, you might wanna know a little bit more about what your hormones are doing. And I'd encourage you to dig deep and find out 
Saliva testing is the most accurate way. If you go to my website, sambopatrick.com, you'll find the way to order a saliva test. Um, it's still not very common with mainstream medical, so um, I encourage you to do it that way. And if you've really liked what you've heard today and you're excited to hear about this new movement that I'd love to see go around the world, please leave a review on Apple or Spotify and make sure that you subscribe and follow all the follow-up episodes and share it with your girlfriends. That'll be fantastic and I'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.